Today, household financial stress is a real problem. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Well, that is post covering finance and property news. Well, we've updated our core market models based on our surveys, and today I'm going to walk you through the main findings. As always, this information comes from the work that we do on an ongoing basis, and it's worth understanding a little bit about the way that our model works. We are surveying households on a weekly basis, and we have 52,000 households in the model at any one time. And in fact, the core market model pulls information from multiple sources, including our surveys. And the point about this is it's a very up-to-date set of data. Now, that allows us to slice and dice the data lots of different ways. So we can look at it by household segments, we can look at it by geographic locations and other elements as well. And because we look at what's going on, we also can form a view as to what may be happening in the future. We look at also scenarios based on where we think things might run to. And that, of course, takes into account economic data and also things like where interest rates may be. And the core market model allows us then to think about mortgage stress and the price trajectory, uh, as well as buying and selling intentions and some of the broader uh, economic and migratory data, particularly, of course, migration is very insignificant at the moment. We bang all of that into the core market model, run our scenarios, and down to a postcode level and also roll up to a region state and all Australia level, we can then form a view as to what may happen with regard to house price scenarios in our different situations. Now, these scenarios are indicative. They're not meant to be predictive, but it does show you some of the sensitivities underway at the moment. And by the way, we are still providing our one-to-one -one service. This is very popular at the moment. A lot of people are trying to work out what's going on. And just to be clear, it's an individual confidential discussion that you can have with me about a particular area, suburb or postcode. I can't give specific financial advice, but I can discuss my data for that given postcode and also look at the underlying trends. And I can look at the stress, the home price trend data and extracts on the trend ahead based on my analysis. Now, this typically takes up to an hour via Zoom or by phone. And there is a cost involved simply because there's a lot of research required to be able to prepare for it. And at the moment, I am running about three to five weeks behind because so many people want to catch up with me. So if you are interested, contact me via the DFA blog, contact details below. Spaces are limited and we are booking ahead at the moment. By the way, I should just clarify my definition of stress once again. We look at it in cash flow terms. Now, there are many different definitions out there from 30% of income or taxable income through to underwriting metrics, but we define stress in cash flow terms, money in, money out. If households have more outgoings, excluding one-off discretionary items and income, we define them as stress. And if they have a mortgage, then they're in mortgage stress. If renting, then they're in rental stress. And we can also look at property investors with their cash flow pressures, and we can identify those as stressed investors. And we can also aggregate all the data up to look at total financial stress. Now, each is expressed as a percentage of households and also of count at a postcode level. We think the latter is a better measure because it shows you where the weight of numbers are. So let's look at the mortgage stress data for April 2023 from my models. And the first observation is that we see rental stress still ticking higher at 61.48% of all those renting. The story here is not a good one. More people are getting into difficulty and we'll talk about which areas and which segments shortly. We'll look at mortgage stress. Mortgage stress has dropped very, very slightly, 46.3% of households, but it's still a record high relative to February 2020 before COVID. And this means that many more people than before are having difficulty meeting those mortgage repayments. In fact, some of the banks in their results season came out and said that there's maybe 20% of households who are, quote, mortgage prisoners, or something around like 20 to 25% who are struggling to make those repayments. So there is a real issue here. And it's worth just recalling that according to the RBA, the household debt ratio is 187.8 still very high, 
And you can see there's been a run up since March 2021. And whilst I always talk about this number, it's also worth reflecting on the fact that it counts it across all households, not just worth with debt and also includes SMEs. So the true number is a lot higher. So if we look at the April data by state, what I've done here is to highlight the field where stress has risen from last month. So in the ACT, the New South Wales area, the NT, Queensland and South Australia. In fact, things have actually eased back very slightly. That's also true in Victoria and Western Australia. The reason for that is extensive refinancing. People have been able to refinance and extend their term and reduce their commitments. That means that they've actually got a little bit of a get out of jail card, at least for the short term. But Tasmania is not so lucky. So mortgage stress has risen. 60.59% of Tasmanians are actually in mortgage stress. And you can see that's a record across the country. And that's so how we get to 46.34. And just to give you a bit of a sense, the 46.34% translates to 1,776,000 households in mortgage stress. That's a very, very high number. On rental stress, once again, you can see that in the ACT in New South Wales and in Tasmania, things move down slightly. In the other states, rental stress continues to grow. And 61.48% of households in renting translates to 1.9 million households in difficulty. Stressed investors continue to grow, particularly in places like the ACT, New South Wales, Northern Territory, Queensland, Western Australia. It did ease back in the other states. And 21.78% of investors, or 636,000, are actually in difficulty. And if we aggregate it up to financial stress, that's all households and the proportion that have registered stress in one of the other categories, then we can see that in the NT, nearly a quarter of households are actually in financial stress. But in other states, it's a lot higher. New South Wales has 48%. Victoria has 43%. And the ACT, 46%. Now we can also look at this same data by segment. And here I'm highlighting simply the highest numbers, not the changes from last month. And you can see here that young growing families continue to be hit the hardest. A lot of those are first time buyers, of course. And we also have a lot of those on the urban fringe. We call those the battling urban. And just to give you some relative comparisons, there are around 129,000 battling urban but 286,000 young growing families, a lot of those are first time buyers. On rental stress, we find that young affluents, mature stable families, and first generation Australians, I call those multicultural establishment Australians, are actually registering the most significant levels of rental stress. And this is a continuing story, of course. Investors, we find that exclusive professionals and young affluents have the highest proportion of stress. That is because they own considerable portfolios of investment properties, many of which are underperforming. And in fact, young affluent investors are the least able to make their investment properties work at the moment. So some of those are having to sell. And if we look at the financial stress number, the aggregate number, we can see there that young growing families and battling urban have the highest degrees of financial stress but it is also spread across other segments and one of the things I want to highlight here is that pretty much all segments across the country are now being impacted by what's going on. Now we can also look at a detailed level at the postcode level and if we look at mortgage stress we can see that the postcode across the country with the highest count of households in mortgage stress is in the Liverpool area, 2170, with more than 12,900 households in difficulty. And that translates to about 90% of those with a mortgage. That said, Campbelltown, 2560, has a higher proportion, even if a slightly lower count. And then we go to Toowoomba up in Queensland, 4350, to Western Australia, postcode 6065, and then to Victoria, which includes Craigieburn, Donnybrook and Roxburgh Park, 3064, with 
45% of households, but more than 9,800 there. And then we can see that Nara Warren, 3,805, with more than 9,600. And Broken Harkaway, which is postcode 3,806, with more than 9,300. And then we go to Riverston, Marsden Park in New South Wales, and then Pakenham down in Victoria. And then regional areas like Ballarat come into vogue, and then back to Hopper's Crossing and Tarnit, and then Queen Bian 2620, and Point Cook, Werribee in Victoria 3030, and Camden 2570. Now the observation here is that a lot of these are high growth areas a lot of new development, a lot of homeland packages, a lot of people who took mortgages out when rates were ultra low, and a lot of people who took advantage of the various government stimulus packages, both state and federal, to be able to buy into the property market. This is going pear shaped for many. And one of the things we're observing is that many households here are now mortgage prisoners. They cannot move because none of the other lenders are prepared to take them on given the very high commitments in terms of cash flow and giving the very low equity that many people have in these areas. If we look at rental stress, we can see that the centre of Melbourne, postcode 3000, has the highest count and 72%. And then we go to Toowoomba up in Queensland, 4350. Then we go to Wentworthville and Westmead in New South Wales, 2145. Then Liverpool, 2170 and then Southport up in Queensland. Then we go to Mount Druitt, 2770 New South Wales, and then up to Queensland again, both uh, places like Cedar Creek and Windaroo, and also Ipswich 4305. And we can continue to see some of the similar areas, Blacktown, for example, Hoppers Crossing, and also it's worth noting that Bundaberg up in Queensland, 4670 also has a high degree of rental stress with more than 7,300 households in rental stress and that's 70% of households in the area and the Mid Coast of course Gosford is also on the list. Then we come to stressed investors so this is the other side this is the lens from an investor perspective and maybe not surprising Postcode 3000 Melbourne also has a high count of stressed investors. The reason is that whilst they are able to put their rents up to an extent, the costs of servicing the investment mortgage has gone up a lot higher. Then we go to places like Raglan, 2795. Then we go to Southport in Queensland, 4215. And Kellyville, and Rouse Hill in New South Wales, 2155. Then Surface Paradise, 4217 in Queensland. Then Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst in New South Wales. It's interesting that some of those close into the city are experiencing significant stress. And in fact, the number of investment properties coming on the market in these areas is rising quite fast. Then we go to 6163, Samson in Western Australia, and then Queensland, Fortitude Valley, 4006. Kruma, DY, and Narrowin, North Kilcombe, the Northern Beaches, in other words. And then we go to Mandra in Western Australia, and then Winston Hills and Balkham Hills in New South Wales, and Hornsby, then Cranbourne in Victoria, St Kilda in Victoria, and places around Lane Cove, and Parramatta, 2150. And if I take Parramatta example, more than 2,400 households are stressed investors, and that's more than half of those investing in the area. And finally, we look at the financial stress aggregate. So this is the rolled up, and the postcode with the highest degree of stress this last month is postcode 2170, Liverpool. Then comes Toowoomba, 4350. Then comes Campbelltown, 2560. The centre of Melbourne, 3000. Then another Victorian postcode, 3064 Roxburgh Park. Then 3029 Tunnit and Hobbs Crossing. Then back to New South Wales, Mount Druitt, 2770. And then Cranbourne in Victoria, 2977 Point Cook and Derrimont, Werribee, 3030. Then Ipswich in Queensland. And then Greystains and Wentworthville in New South Wales. 
and then Blacktown in New South Wales, Springfield in Queensland, Western Australian postcode 6065, which includes Tapping and Wanderoo, Ballarat 3350, and Bundaberg 4670. And just a quick observation here, you'll see here that there's quite a range of different types of postcodes being impacted. But again, you can see that a lot of the new development around the existing areas is where a lot of the issues are. Again, this is because a lot of households have actually highly leveraged to buy into a property with a mortgage, or indeed are struggling to pay the rent in those areas. And I'll also make the point that some of the investors in those areas who hold property are finding it really difficult to be able to cover the costs of the rising mortgages. And so I expect to see more properties coming on the market in these areas in the months ahead. But this is gonna be a slow burn. This is not gonna happen just overnight. Now let me talk briefly about our scenarios, which are a way of exploring different futures and considering the consequences. It's not a forecast, but it's to facilitate understanding and sensitivity and debate. Now, none of those scenarios may turn out to be right. Things change, of course. And we use a framework driven from our core market model. And then we look at a few different potential outcomes updated with the latest results. And the scenarios run forward from today. And here they are. So the best case scenario is that rates stay at 3.85% and they fall next year and inflation eases ahead of RBA expectations while wages rise faster and there's no recession in Australia. That is, if you like, the best hopium that you can have. The base case, though, is that rates will rise to more than 4%, which means that you'll be seeing mortgage rates at 65 to 7.5% and that rates stay high through 2023 and into 2024, whilst inflation stays above the target until 2024, 2025. And we also assume that there'll be no recession in Australia. And then the worst case scenario is that rates rise above 4.25% with mortgage rates above 7.5%. And the rates stay high in 2024 along with inflation, but wages growth stalls due to recession here. And then we see significant cuts in rates, but in a way the damage is already done and higher unemployment means that more people are forced to sell. And here's the scenario based on the latest data up till the 1st of May. We look at houses first. The best case scenario is that over the next three years, there's a cumulative small rise. The base case though is for a further fall and we're looking maybe under 20%, but overall, still significant easing of values over the medium term. And of course, the worst case scenario, if we get a real recession with high unemployment, is that prices still have significant downside risk. Units follow the trend pretty much on the best case scenario, don't fall as much. That's partly because there is more demand and also the overall leverage scenario is different. And the base case also doesn't drop as much, but still we're looking at maybe a 30% drop worst case for units across Australia. I do have this information at the state basis, but this is just an aggregate across the country. And I will just talk about also one particular segment. So I look at young growing families because they are a very significant issue relating to what's going on. And the best case scenario for young growing families is the first time buyers who are in the market for the first time. And even with the best case scenario, the chances are we will see slight falls in value over the next three years. That said, the base case is a fall of more than 20% for houses and the worst case, a fall of more than 45%. Now that's unlikely of course, but should be considered. Units follow the same sort of trend with slightly lower levels of falls and it means that the base case and worst case come in slightly better than for houses. Now, all I'm saying here is that people need to be careful when they're thinking about where values may go. And of course, if you're buying as an owner occupier, you can probably risk the value falling, but of course that may leave you into negative equity and also make it hard to refinance later. Probably investors, I think should stay on the sidelines, which is why we're seeing lots of property investors selling their properties at the moment. And numbers of listings are actually increasing. Now, of course, I do run detailed 
analytics down at a postcode level. And here's an example. This is postcode 2500 in Wollongong. And I give information about the number of households and the proportion who are owning outright, proportion borrowing, the proportion renting. We can look at the proportion in mortgage stress and rental stress, also investor stress, and how many households are in financial stress. So here in this postcode, more than 8,500 are actually in financial stress. And we can also then look at the distribution between houses and units and the number of vacant properties. And we can also look at the gross and net investment yield. And it's worth highlighting that in this particular postcode, the gross investment yield, that's the relationship between the price of the property and the theoretical full rental recovery that you might get, but doesn't account for the borrowing costs, come out positive at 3.5%, but the net investment yield is flat, zero. And then we look at the information relating to taxable income from the ATO and the census. And then we take all the information and then we run our scenario. So here in this postcode, best case for houses, we think over the next three years is a cumulative fall of about 4%. The base case is worse. And of course, the worst case is even worse. Units fall, but not quite as much. And if you want detailed information about a particular postcode, uh, you can always contact me via the blog and I'm happy to send a single snapshot. Or if you want to subscribe via Patreon, you can actually get the updated set each month and I'll be sending this out to the Patreon members later on today. Now at this point I will highlight the fact that many people don't know what to do when they get into financial difficulty. They put their head in the sand and assume that things will work their way out. That's unlikely. Whilst the banks can provide some level of support, they tend to look at it from their perspective and try and work out what's best for them rather than what's best for an individual borrower. So it's worth talking to an individual financial counsellor. And I recommend the National Debt Helpline. It's a free service from the government. It's on 1-800-007-007. And they have huge amounts of capacity and capability to advise and help. And certainly from my conversations with a number of people, uh, I found that they've provided very, very helpful information to negotiate the issue of how to deal with high levels of debt. So if you are in difficulty, it's really worth thinking about reaching out to the National Debt Helpline or your lender if you have a mortgage and try and figure out how to deal with the situation. As always, I highlight the fact that most people still don't have a cash flow. They still don't know what they're spending, what money is coming in, what money is going out. So the first thing is build a cash flow. And in fact, the Your Money website has a very significant tool set from the ASIC, of course, to be able to build a cash flow. The second is prioritize. So not everything is equally important. And unfortunately, what I see quite often is that people prioritize the wrong expenditure. And you need to trim your spending to be able to meet your commitments, of course, and avoid the temptation to just reach for payday loans or more credit cards. Unfortunately, many people are doing that as their savings are eroded. And the third point is simply this is not going to go away anytime soon. So it is worth being preemptive and proactive relating to how you handle your current financial situation. If you do have a deficit of cash flow money and money out and you're unable to trim your expenditure sufficiently to be able to correct that, then you need to take more radical uh, action. And some of that action could be refinancing, but be very careful. Often the refinancing options helps the bank, but doesn't necessarily help you as an individual. And of course, if they extend the term of the loan, you end up paying a lot more interest over time, which means that you need to not set and forget this if in fact you do extend your term. Also, the banks are prepared to offer interest only arrangements, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem because of course you have to repay the capital later. And often what I see over maybe two or three years is that people end up refinancing once or twice but then ultimately have to sell their property. And sometimes getting out early is actually still the best strategy. So in summary, we are seeing now the fruits of high interest rates coming through. I do expect mortgage stress in particular to stay high and rental stress to continue to grow. And I do think that we're going to see more pressure on households. Now, the budget next week may offer some light at the end of the tunnel, particularly if they do provide relief relating to energy bills, but that's going to be fairly minimal. 
And we're still seeing wage growth much slower than inflation. I still think the RBA is right to say that inflation will still be above target through to 2024, 2025. So this is a slow burn. This is a long grind. And households need to lay their plans appropriately for the long run. Certainly don't believe the Spruikers. Property price falls are not over. We are going to see more households getting into difficulty. And the cost of living will continue to apply more pressure to more households over the medium term. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.